I get to watch myself grow older when I watch that video. <laughs> Long hair, short hair, gray hair. Well, it's great to be with everybody today. I tell you what, before I get started, since uh, some of you know each other and some of you do not, let me invite everybody, if you can, take a moment to stand up and just introduce yourself to the people front and back and either side of you so we all know who we're here with. <clears throat> Okay, let's get comfortable. All right. All right, let's grab our seats. First, I want to publicly thank the Blandons, thank you, Don, Nanette, and uh, now that I know the boss of the family is Sarah, uh, we all had dinner last evening. I get to be here with my wife, who will be speaking tomorrow. We only get to be at conferences every now and then together. Um, so just a little bit of setup, and then I've got quite a lot to charge through. I, I've had a bit of an odd career. I got interested in the whole subject of the aging of our population in 1974. So this is my 45th year on the beat. <clears throat> Along the way, I've gotten tangled up in all sorts of figuring things out and trying to make sense of health or housing or automotive or family or dermatologic or orthopedic or uh, media tech. I mean, it's been sort of a fun ride trying to figure out what's going to happen as we get to live longer. And somewhere along the way, I passed my 65th birthday, which was really odd, because I was 24 when I got started on this track. And I would tell you, for those of you who have not yet passed 65, it's quite interesting what kind of mailing list you get on. <laughs> um, a few months ago, I got this beautiful invitation from the Trident Society. And Maddie and I snorkel quite a lot around the world, and I used to scuba dive a little bit, so I figured it's some kind of diving club. Turns out it's a burial by sea prepay uh, <laughs> cremation funeral. And uh, I'm thinking, I guess I'm on that list now. Um, however, these are, uh, as our daughter, we were with our daughter a few weeks ago, and she told my wife and I that these are the very best years of our lives. And I'm inclined to think that's true. So being 68, gives me a chance to look at some of these issues in a more personal way. Um, what I'm going to try to do with you here today is, first of all, share with you some of the work that our company, Ageway, has been doing the last few years to try to figure out all the different dimensions of retirement, and then how are people going to pay for this? Uh, I'm not sure that we're right, that I'll be right about all these things, but I'm going to give you what I believe is the best way of looking at this, but I invite and encourage you over the next few days and the weeks and months ahead to think about what is it that I said that you might add on to or make more real for your communities or the regions of the country that you're involved with. Uh, let me give you a bit of a setup too for some work um, we've just finished. A few years ago, actually five years ago, I got to meet the chairman of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan. And through Brian and then a fellow named Andy Sig, who's now running Merrill Lynch, Andy Sig said, I bet there's a lot of things you wish you understood better about the future of retirement. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you figure them all out? 
And don't worry about who you're going to get to fund that. Think of us as being just sort of like a patron. Do all the things you'd like to do and do the most extraordinary body of research that has ever been conducted in this world on these topics. And so we've just come out of four years of working on eight major studies having to do with the future of retirement. We um, reviewed thousands of articles and papers and other people's studies in universities, uh, governments from the United States and around the world. We had 140 experts weighing in. We had 43 focus groups in the United States. As I mentioned, we did eight studies. We had 50,000 survey respondents, and the respondents were representative. So we know the different cuts per county, per region, in terms of age and ethnicity and gender and lifestyle. It wasn't just all people who might have called into a news poll that they saw on television. Uh, we put 70,000 hours into these studies. And I will tell you, for those of you who try to see if you can catch the media's attention or perhaps impact the master narrative about these issues. Um, when you do these studies, sometimes they're called newsmaker studies, you hope to get 20 million, 50 million media impressions. And if you're doing a good job, you'll get that. We've just passed our 10 billionth media impression on these studies. So we're in the public mind. And let me share with you some of what we've been learning. By the way, I will tell you that a version of what I'm going to cover today in a special report has been made available to Don, who is going to be sending it all to you before the afternoon is out. So uh, let, let me put a context in place. And some of these things you'll all be familiar with, but most of what I'm going to cover today I have not ever covered before. So we'll have some fun looking at it together. Uh, we all know that we're, we're in the midst of a longevity revolution. Um, you know, not too long ago, people didn't wonder what they were going to do when they turned 60 or 70 because they wouldn't be turning 60 or 70. They'd be passing away before then. Our medical system didn't need to be expert at things like hypercholesterolemia or osteoarthritis or cognitive impairments like Alzheimer's because most people died young of acute infectious diseases, accidents, trauma, childbirth, before they got old enough to have their bodies break down. We didn't need to worry that much about pension systems because there were so many young people and not that many older people. It was going to be kind of an easy handoff. But as you can see, this last century has been quite extraordinary. And I'm sure all of you are also aware that we're not even that great at longevity in the United States. There's about 30 countries around the world that have a higher life expectation than we do. I would also point out that this is life expectancy at birth. And having mixed it up lots of times with demographers over these decades, uh, demographers can often confuse the public. That's a number that people often think about. Well, what if I live to 79? But that's a life expectancy at birth. If you're already, let's say, 60, the life expectancy is right around 85, unless you're a woman, in which case it's a few years older than that. And that's assuming, essentially, no breakthroughs for the next quarter century. And so it is possible that we might be better off imagining not living a 75 or an 80-year life, but a 90 or 100-year life. To put this in even bigger perspective, this is a chart of the average life expectancy over the past 100,000 years. And what you see is that throughout 99% of all the years that humans have walked this earth, the life expectation worldwide has been under 18 at birth. I'm often reflecting this last year when we talk about our Constitution and what it imagined about the future. The day that our Constitution was signed, the median age in America was 16, and the life expectancy was 35. We have more people today, over 80 in America, than there were in all of America back in that era. So who would have imagined a world where people are living longer and longer and longer. And that makes it really fun for people who do the work that you do, that I do, because it means that everything about this is new. People often think that what's the new new? It's the new tech or the new app. No, the new new is this frontier of longevity that has never been mapped. It's never been contemplated. It's never been envisioned. It's never been populated. It's never been activated. 
One of the effects of all this longevity is that two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. And I will tell you, as the person who maybe has done more research on these people than any human being in the history of the world, I would tell you that most of these people are clueless about what they ought to be doing with their lives. Last year, the average retiree in America watched 49 hours of television a week. That's 2,940 minutes of, TV, of passive TV watching. Now, if you or Don were to gather a group of people together and imagine what's the purpose of longevity, it's probably not to just sit in a couch and watch TV all day. And that begs yet another interesting question, which is who is dreaming up the role and purpose of older adults? And is it getting the amount of attention that it probably deserves as an issue. On top of this longevity, we've got this other demographic uh, dynamic going on that you're all well aware of as well. Um, but we'll see how this is going to impact the funding of longevity in just a few minutes. Back in the 1950s, when the boys came back from the war in the late 40s, all of a sudden we started having lots and lots of kids, the infamous uh, baby boom. Uh, if you were to look at the 1950s and track each demographic segment in terms of which ones grew or shrank relative to their own size at the beginning of the, the decade, uh, you'd see that the 1950s was a time of growth of kids. By the way, at the beginning of the decade, there were a few thousand pediatricians. By the end of the decade, there were tens of thousands of pediatricians. Then we have the 1960s. Teenagehood became the focus of American life. The 1970s, all of a sudden, the boomers are moving into their 20s. The housing market exploded. The 1980s, all of a sudden, the number of 18 to 34-year-olds shrank, began to shrink. And so we had this huge bulge in middle-aged people. The 1990s would have been a great time to have been the president of the United States. And I've had this discussion with President Clinton because because there was a shortage of young people relative to the decade before, you could have taken great credit for all the low unemployment, which, by the way, is the exact same thing that's happening now. As boomers leave the workforce, whoever's in the White House can say, oh, it's because of me we have such great unemployment levels. It was all predictable. If you look at the, the beginning of the 20th century, all of a sudden we started seeing the rising up of 40 and 50-year-olds. And I'm going to click this device and show you how America is reconfiguring demographically between 2010 and 2030. Yeah, now I could sit down right now because this is interesting. I mean, this has never happened before. And so if I'm giving a speech, let's say, for AdvaMed, the medical devices industry convention, I get a standing ovation right about now. <laughs> Because they look at this and they think, wow, this is, this is unbelievable. However, if you're involved with pensions or intergenerational exchanges, yeah, you figure this out. And by the way, that is your assignment to figure this out. <laughs> Let me give you an example of how this is playing out. Um, we have a lot of new retirees. So we've got this big bulge, like a baby boom has become this age wave, and we have a huge number of people migrating into retirement. Not only into retirement, but spending more and more years after those birthdays. On top of that, to make it even more captivating, what retirement was 30 years ago, 10 years ago, is morphing. So if you could be sitting in this room next to your parents, if they could be the same age as you sitting here, they'd be thinking about a retirement of rest, of leisure, of kicking back. But you're probably thinking of a retirement of maybe a new career, or writing your first book of poems, or traveling the world, or going skiing with your grandchildren. That the images of retirement and what it's going to be have very little resemblance to what it used to be. So people are beginning to think, wow, I might live 80 years or 90, or someone might say, I've got an aunt who's 103. How's that going to be paid for? And that's where the discussion gets very ornery, because most people think someone else is going to pay for it. The solution will come from somewhere. 
It's a reasonable perspective, I guess. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I was born in 1950, we had air raid drills. Any of you remember those? Where the idea was you were going to practice if a thermonuclear device was going to go off in your high school, by putting your head under your desk, you'd be okay. That was sort of like a safety measure. <laughs> as best as I can tell, we have a lot of the same strategy operational here. Just put your head under the desk and maybe everything will turn out okay. So let's look at a few examples. I'm very captivated by Social Security. Let's look at it not from a Democrat or Republican or gerontologist point of view. Let's just look at it from a numbers point of view. If you look at 1940 uh, to, let's say, the year 2016, the life expectancy has gone up 15 years. The life expectancy at age 65 has grown by 50%. The average retirement age, you should know, for 20 years after Social Security passed was 70. Older people thought, why do I want to stop working? I kind of like what I do. I like the income and makes me feel useful to other people. The population of people over 65 has, gone, has multiplied five times. The ratio of workers to recipients has gone from 159 workers per each retiree to 2.8 to 1 on its way down to 2 to 1. The number of recipients has grown from 222,000 to over 60 million. The average payout was $220 then in 1940s dollars. Today it's about 16,000. The total payout from our federal government has gone from 49 million to 916 billion. And the percentage of our federal budget that goes to just Social Security has gone from 0.03% to 24%. And that's before all the baby boomers start taking up space. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at this and it makes me nervous. Because it was never intended. We never expected that people were going to live so long, and so many of them. And then there would be declining birth rates and all sorts of things. So we've asked the generations. We asked the silent generation, the group just, the cohort right in front of the boomers, how do you think retirement is going to be funded for you? And obviously, most of these people are no longer working. So they say, well, it's a three-legged stool, but the big leg here is the government, some personal, and some employer. But then if you jump down to the boomers, it's almost an even distribution. But then if you jump down to Gen X, they say that, you know, I'm watching the tea leaves and I see demography and I'm not foolish. This is going to be on me. But if you look at millennials, now, let's build the story. So more and more people are coming to believe that their own long-term financial well-being will be because of their own actions. So then we look at the United States and think about our mentality regarding self-discipline and money. What's our savings rate? Not that great. And I thought, where have I seen this pattern before? Obesity rates. So here we have one of the interesting challenges of democracy. And I'm a big fan of democracy. I am, as I travel the world, we travel quite a lot. I feel like, boy, we have the greatest of all countries. But you give us a lot of freedom around how we're going to handle our health and how we're going to handle our money, and we don't behave so well. Eighty-one percent last year, the study was just done, say they don't even, they've never sat down even like throw a number on the wall. How much money do you think you're going to need? Eighty-one percent of the public says, no idea. What else? We ask people, do you feel, these are people who are pre-retired, not yet there, how far do you think you're going to be able to, to live and, and be okay financially? Not very far. This is interesting. We ask people, if you were saving for retirement, what was the trigger to start? And by the way, I know I have, I've worked in the so-called aging network for 40 plus years, and there's the overwhelming belief that people's retirement should be funded by the government. 
And maybe that's the right way to do things, but as I look at the numbers and the demography, that seems like it's going to be more challenged in the future. So we say, well, where are people getting kind of the tr activated to save? And interestingly, it's their employer, overwhelmingly, more than their AARP or more than their church or more than a financial professional. It's my employer had a plan or my employer had an educational program. And, not, and you know what else? They usually uh, trusted that. It's a good thing to know. Now I'm going to make this uh, more a playful mosaic. Normally when people talk about funding retirement, they principally talk about it in terms of the, the currency of dollars. I'm going to take a look at the currency of all the different aspects of our lives as we live into that period and think about and show you the ways that people are contemplating making trade-offs or trade-ups or trade-downs or relocations in order to go the distance. I'll start first with finances. We ask people, are you hoping to be rich? No. What people say is, I just like to be able to go to sleep at night and know my family's gonna be okay. Then I'm gonna not be homeless or poverty stricken when I grow older. What are your top worries in retirement, financial worries? Number one, I or somebody I love will have a terrible health challenge. Number two, boy, the cost of things. Most people don't understand inflation. If I tell you that that million dollars you think you have 20 years from now is only worth a half a million, people think you're making a joke. Third, not having the money to live the life that people want to live, and fourth, outliving their money. My dad, who passed away four and a half years ago at 91, was a, was a very, I mean, he was a great guy, kind of a character. I think if Rush Limbaugh didn't show up for his job one day, my dad would have liked to have taken that slot. Um, we grew up in Newark, New Jersey. My father was very responsible, hardworking, never went to college, kind of earned his way into a middle-class life. But he had diabetes. So my dad thought he'd live about 70 or 75. And he planned financially for he and my mom to be in good shape throughout his life with some insurance after he passed. Well, as I mentioned, my dad lived to be 91. You can't imagine how hard it was for my dad, a very prideful, hardworking guy, to have to take checks from Maddie and I every month. He way outlived his resources. We also ask people, how do you feel about your money decisions? Interestingly, people second guess financial decisions more than any other decisions in their life. More than do I have the right mate? Do I live in the right town? Do I have the right job? Not nearly as much as people second guessing, am I doing the right thing? Am I, do I trust the people I'm looking to for guidance? Do I even understand what this is all about? To make things even worse, about two-thirds of our population say they don't even understand what anybody's talking about. <laughs> now, i got to tell you, I'm uh, 68. I've written 16 books. I've got a PhD. I'm considered like Mr. Agewave. Uh, last year, I was, uh, there was a designation of the 35 most influential people in financial services over the last 35 years. And it was Alan Greenspan and Warren Buffett and Chuck Schwab. And I was in that group. I was the only non-financial professional in the group. But I got to tell you, I sit at financial meetings all the time, and I hear people talking about 403Bs and 529s, and, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what they're talking about. The language of this industry is so non-user friendly, it's crazy. Half of the American population says they never had a role model for money stuff. Maybe it wasn't their dad or their mom, or they didn't have a boss or an aunt or an uncle, but usually we follow role models. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a basketball player. I grew up in New Jersey, went to the garden, Walt Frazier, you know? So I would be home trying to be Walt Frazier. But who do people model after when it comes to their money? Who are the role models? And I don't mean, gee, Oprah's wealthy, what does she do? Oprah's amazing. What's a real role model for a woman or a young man? 
Then we asked, and we did not go public with this, and you may disagree, but I'm going to share it with you anyhow. We asked people in America, by the way, I've now done this same question in 20 countries around the world, and the response is almost identical. As people live longer, what should the government do to support an aging population? First, people say, well, gee, I mean, if you're going to be living 80 or 90 years, maybe you're not old any when you're 65. We ought to move that age. But right behind it, people say, enforce additional savings, mandated savings, which runs against a lot of the spirit of our country of letting people make their own mind up. But what people are saying is, I just can't do it on my own. Make me save and help us help ourselves. 90% of the American public would like financial education to be taught in high school. By the way, I've been doing studies now for a quarter of a century. I have never seen any question that has gotten a 90% response. People, in our family, we have two kids. We can't get a 75% agreement on anything. Financial education should be taught to teenagers. Right now, 36 states in America require sex education. Only five states require financial education. So here we've got generations of young people going to be living very long lives, many of whom don't have a role model, don't understand the language, could use some help. Just to get the, the game started, we asked people, all right, so what kind of changes, what kind of corrections would you be willing to do? And these are all in the report, so I won't dwell on them. People said, well, maybe I need to learn how to spend less. Maybe I ought to get some financial counsel or advice. Who can I turn to? Who's trustworthy? Maybe I ought to do better at taking advantage of tax-protected accounts, and so on. But the plot thickens. Let's look at these other six categories. We asked people, we're talking about retirement, What's the most important thing to achieving a happy retirement? Not even close. Having good health. And by the way, having health challenges has big financial impact. The number one reason that people stopped working before they thought they would was because they got sick or a loved one became ill and they had to be caring for them. And then the out-of-pocket costs and then the long-term care. So oddly, one of the smartest things a person can do for their financial well-being is to have more physical and emotional well-being. As we grow older, there are changes, um, more arthritis, more varicosity in the veins, orthopedic impairments, and I could totally blow your whole weekend. Um, But more and more people are now talking about, you've seen these covers. I've been at these meetings. I've got friends. You know, the billionaires in Silicon Valley are all trying to beat aging. They're all trying to, can we live to 150? And by the way, I've been at many conferences this last year. I'm involved with the X Prize. I keynoted the Exponential Medicine Conference last year. People are quite convinced that while there might not be some sort of an exponential breakthrough in the next year or two, the next 20 years, no question. And so half of all the kids born in the last couple of years, your children or grandchildren, are going to live to be 150. Now, who's going to pay for that? The challenge is how do we match health span to lifespan? So we've done sort of an oddball thing with our health care system, is that we are struggling over how to distribute it and how to fund it, but we haven't stopped to say, is it actually relevant? We have 126 medical schools in America. There's only 12 departments of geriatrics. 90% of all the doctors, nurses, rehab technicians who will graduate from school this year will not have taken one elective in geriatric medicine. We don't have much as a preventative health system. And our rehab and recovery systems are uneven. So maybe if we could figure out how to match our health span to our lifespan, we'd have healthier 70 and 90 year olds 
who'd be more financially well off. One of the things we need is medical excellence. And I know that Kerry's in the room here, Kerry Hannon, who's probably the, one of the several great writers on these subjects. I have been going after AARP. In fact, I just spoke to Joanne Jenkins about a week ago on this. It's unconscionable for me that we have so many physicians in this country caring for our moms and dads who are incompetent at doing so. I'm not saying they're not nice people and they didn't go to medical school. I'm saying they don't understand how to deal with an elderly person. They don't understand polypharmacy. I have an Aunt Phyllis who sort of was like an extra mom to me growing up. Uh, my, my aunt and uncle lived a few blocks away from us. She's now 93. So she's got a lot of pain from her arthritis. So her doctor prescribed Vicodin. She lives alone. So a few months ago, my Aunt Phyllis got up in the middle of the night, fell down and broke her neck. Now, what kind of doctor prescribes Vicodin, opioids, to a woman in her 90s who lives alone? How can we have a medical system where doctors are not trained? By the way, you go to Great Britain, every doctor has received training in geriatrics. Japan, one in two. And not only that, but because geriatrics is not sexy or highly compensated, the number of geriatricians in America, while we've got 40,000 or so pediatricians, we had 9,000 geriatricians five years ago, but they're retiring. We've got about 5,000 now. Second, boy, do we need better science. I watched every single minute of every single debate leading up to the last election. There was not one question focused on better science so we could eliminate some of the diseases of aging. Not one minute. Alzheimer's is going to become the sinkhole of the 21st century, and it will, it's a disease that will not be beaten by doing crosswords puzzles or eating a vegan diet. This is a disease that's going to have to be beaten in the lab. And yet for every dollar we spend on caregiving, people with Alzheimer's, we spend less than a half a penny on the science needed to beat the disease in the first place. And third, we've got to make ourselves a healthier bunch if we're going to go the distance. And whether that's through exercise or, or social interactivity or moving more or eating healthier diets, better attitude, sleeping better. And we need to set a higher standard for what's possible. Here's an example of a gal I believe is 86. Don is going to try this after our break today. Not bad. We asked people, what's the scariest disease in later life? It's not even close. It's Alzheimer's and related dementias. And as many of you know, the incidence is one in three over the age of 85, one in two over the age of 90. So here's the cruel irony of our modern medical system that we're doing better and better and better at keeping people alive longer and longer and longer, which means that more and more people will have Alzheimer's and related dementias unless we stop it in its tracks. When I was 30, I was lucky. I collaborated on a book with Jonas Salk, who back in, when some of you were very young, when I was like three, he had his breakthrough. I didn't obviously know him until I was, in my, until I was 30. But he talked about how in the 1940s, 
people thought that poliomyelitis was this horrible, who can even understand it, and you catch it from strangers, so don't dare ever touch people you don't know, and don't go swimming in public swimming pools because you'd catch polio, and, and if you got, got it and you survived, you might have to be in an iron lung for the rest of your life. So a lot of people thought that what the world needed was more iron lungs. And Salk explained to me at dinner, he thought, no, my attitude was completely opposed to that. My attitude was, we need to stop this disease. Most of the high-minded, really good people who are involved with the Alzheimer's crusade are trying to create Alzheimer's-friendly communities and Alzheimer's-friendly you know, buildings. I'd like to turn the disease off. And that would put a whole lot of long-term care questions away, that would put a whole lot of long-term care-related caregivers, free them up, it would give us a different future. Tomorrow, Maddie's going to talk about, with the extra longevity of women, what the health expenses are of women. But most people don't realize how much is not paid for by Medicare. So in addition to whatever your retirement savings ought to be, do you have an extra quarter of a million dollars for the out-of-pocket health stuff? We ask people, what changes, course corrections, would you consider making? People thought, you know, I could take better care of myself. Second, maybe I could get a little smarter about my health insurance and figure out how it works. Maybe I could use some more of the community programs that might be quite good. People are even thinking maybe I should buy long-term care insurance. But even having the discussion would probably take people further than they are right now. Now let's talk about work. Work's an interesting issue because it is one mechanism for impacting retirement funding. So we ask people, pre-retirees, what do you think you're going to miss the most in retirement? People are unequivocal about it. They said, I'm going to miss the income. But then we asked thousands of retirees, hey, what do you miss the most? The action, the people, the connectivity. You know, when you're working, you're in your 50s or early 60s, maybe you're tired, you think, oh, I'd like a break. My recommendation, take a sabbatical or, or stop working for a while. But to stop working permanently and then live 20 or 25 years, boy, that's a... That's twilight zone for a lot of people. So we ask people, what would your ideal plan be? And what people say is, you know, 29% say, I'd, I'd like to stop working and, and never work again. Fine, if you can afford that and you can live a life within those conditions, great. 8% of the population say, I'd like to be working full time. And I'm not going to go political today, because I know I'm not supposed to do that anymore. But <laughs> I watch Mr. Trump and Mr. Giuliani. And those folks are in retirement age, and they're working full time. And I think they could use a break every now and then. <laughs> uh, I'm, not sure they're, they're, I'm not sure they're hitting their marks like, they, like an older person could. Um, but what people say is, hey, you know what? Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to work, but less. You know, maybe if I could work three, four days a week or eight months a year. Or I'd like to work on projects. You know, can I work on something for eight months and then take four months off and then? Now, by the way, we have Uberized the world or airbnb the world. So we're able with logistics to plug people in and to plug them out, plug and play. Why aren't we doing that more with work? Because if people could work, in a little while I'm going to show you what the economics are by working a little bit longer, people could work. You'd have a lot of the funding of retirement issues solved. People always say to me, well, Ken, give me, you know, best examples of flex retirement. And I would tell you that I think it's the entertainment industry. <laughs> you know, the Stones are now older than our Supreme Court. And... Uh, I'll tell you what, they still make some pretty great music. You know, Springsteen decided he's going to become a playwright. He's 68. Um, we have people in the entertainment industry who work and take a break, and then they work some more. And we're beginning to find ourselves okay with that. 
We ask people, what kind of course corrections could you make? Work on a part-timer project basis in retirement. By the way, you also have to let go of your, uh, you know, I'm a senior this or I'm the head of that. A lot of people say, hey, you know, just working and being around younger people and learning new things and getting a paycheck and not having to cut into my principal, it's very satisfying. Then people say, I'd like to learn some skills because I want to do something different. And here's a really interesting zone. Because here you've got a lot of 55 and 60 year olds who are thinking, I want to transform myself into something different. I've been a school teacher, now I want to play jazz. Do I have to be good? No, my parents aren't around anymore. I can just enjoy myself. <laughs> or I've been a head of marketing. What I like to do is to help kids learn how to do marketing. Or I've been a this and I want to be a that. The idea of having a 50 or 60 year life and then a metamorphosis is clearly the model for the future. But then we need our community colleges and our HR programs to help people reinvent themselves. Otherwise, they stay home and watch 49 hours of television a week. All right, let's take a look at family. Um, what aspect of your life is the greatest source of satisfaction? And we gave people a choice of all these seven different categories. And I will tell you that money was not number one. Work was not even close to what I think. Oh, you know, I have Sigmund Freud said the things that matter most in life are love and work. Most people don't buy that. They think work, eh. family, just towers. This is interesting. Among people 18 to 34, the number one living arrangement currently is living at home with parents, more than any other living arrangement among people in this stage of life. How many of you are familiar with the word FOMO? Raise your hand. How many of you aren't quite sure what FOMO is? OK, yeah. So there you have an interesting thing going on, which is that, and I'll explain that those of us who grew up in another time believe, you know, hey, when I was 16 or 18, my parents told me, You're on, you know, get out there and get a job. And that was partly how you were measured. So we see that all these kids living home with their parents, and we say, what is their problem? Oh, and then we can rationalize it. Well, the cost of living is so high, and real estate is so high, and college tuition, and college debt. Or we can judge them negatively. I asked the word FOMO because it's believed to be by researchers and psychologists all over the world now. It is the number one driving force in the lives of people in this stage of life. Fear of missing out. So these young people check their phones between 80 and 150 times a day to see what people are doing and thinking and feeling and showing off about. Ask them how they feel doing it, crummy. Makes them depressed. Can they stop? They cannot stop. It's the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning, the last thing they do before they go to sleep at night. It's causing all sorts of mental and emotional imbalances among an entire generation. And I would say, this is just to be provocative, that most of us who are older are clueless about it. So here we've got an epidemic of addiction going on among young people that's impacting how they feel about themselves as an example. And then we've got this other thing, which is that partly because of a longer life and partly because their parents bought homes in burbs or have apartments with an extra bedroom, the kids are saying, hey, I like my folks. When I grew up, we had one TV set. It was black and white. And so we had a TV room. The family would get together. And so you were a part of your family's thing, you know? Kids today, they got their own Netflix. They got their own screens. They can go into their bedroom and be left alone. Hey, living in a home is great. Mom does the laundry. But the plot thickens. It's not just the boomerang home. And it's not just that many of us who might be 50 or 60 or 70 measure these young people by our own metrics of what is a person supposed to be or do without going into their minds and saying, how are they doing? But this one gets to be consequential when it comes to retirement and funding. 62% of people over 50 are subsidizing, to some extent, their kids. 
even if the kids are in their 20s and 30s. $6,800 a year on average. Last year, parents of early adult children spent $60 billion on those kids' groceries. $20 billion on their cell phone bills. It's an entire hidden economy. And by the way, these are the very same people that may not have enough money to fund their own retirements. Here's an example. Touch more volume. We, uh, I'm about to say something that uh, I, I have to request uh, that not be, I'm not going to say it then. We have, we have a study coming out in several weeks where we've calculated the amount of money that people who have children between 18 and 34 are contributing to their own retirement accounts and the amount of money they're spending subsidizing their children. And you will be dazzled when you see the numbers. And so we have this whole new phenomenon because... Boomer parents and their kids have got a lot of connectivity. The cost of living in cities is so crazy high. College tuition is busting a lot of people. That we've now got 50 and 60 year olds who are taking their own financial futures and sharing it with their children so that their children might have a better shot. Is that enabling? Maybe. Is it empowering? Maybe. Hardly talked about. And what are the rules? If you're a parent, what's the right? Here's the article. You get the kids like that clip saying, this is it. This is what we're going to do. Let's keep going. So we asked, have you had an in-depth discussion with your parents or your kids about these money boundaries? No. People are just doing it. You need some help, don't tell your dad. You need a little loan, don't tell your mom. Um, yeah, I'll pay your bill, it's free, isn't it? No, it's not free. When you do certain things like Netflix, you can add people on it, but that cell bill, if you have your kids on it, you're paying their monthly bill. Very clever on the part of the phone, the, the long line companies. Have people even talk to their spouses about their situation financially. Half have not. So there's a lot of talk about getting the discussion going. Wow. And I will, partly because I'm getting to the point in life where I feel like gloves are off. Um, <laughs> the aging network, all the professionals work in the aging field, are overwhelmingly focused on underclass, struggling, poorer, older old people. So they don't even talk about money issues and therefore they think they're not important. A lot of the wealth management firms are interested in wealth and wealthy people. But most of the American population could use a lot of help with what you guys are all about. So how do you turbocharge the discussions to save lives? We ask people, what changes would you make? Educate my kids. 
Number one request, I don't know how to do it, can you help me? What is the software, what is the app so I can sit down with my nine-year-old or 14-year-old or 28-year-old and talk about money? What else are they saying? Support them less. Have the kids you know, understand that money has its limits, state school versus a private school and so on. Leisure. I will tell you that when we began these studies, we were asked to put together a list of the 100 most intelligent and thoughtful people having to do with retirement. And we broke them into categories. Um, mental health, many experts. Slips and falls, disability, many experts. Um, housing, many experts. Fun, no one. Not one expert on fun in maturity. So that's a little twisted. Because we all talk about how I've been working so hard, I want to have some fun. Uh, I want to enjoy myself. That's kind of what retirement offers more than any other stage in life. And one of the ways we've come to look at it is age wave in terms of time affluence. We often think that affluence is about financial affluence. Don may have $100,000, I may have $20,000, he's more affluent than me. But you reach 63 or 64 or 65, and now you've got decades of time affluence. Yet we haven't really shown people or activated what things people might do with that and what's the right portfolio. For example, Last year, 23% of America's retirees volunteered. Those that volunteered spent two hours a week doing so. It's pretty good. That means that the average retiree in America volunteers 23 minutes a week. Watches TV 2,940 minutes a week. Volunteering 23 minutes a week. Has anybody ever sat down and had a major global conclave on how does one fill one's free time with a combination of service and a combination of giving back and a combination of staying current and relevant and fun? Here are some things we've learned. Retirees began to talk about what matters in life and what begins to matter more than things are experiences. And they don't even have to be expensive experiences. Just experiences with your grandkids, time with friends, being free of pressure. And who you're with is more important than what you do. And we found that people of very modest financial resources have every bit as much fun in their leisure as people who are very wealthy. And they may be doing it at the local park, or by staying at their niece and nephew's home in a college town or by learning how to paint or draw or volunteering at the community center. So getting more sophisticated about what to do with all this free time is an area that we think is going to come more alive. Some people say they want to disconnect. This crazy family went to Africa thinking they ought to reconnect. That's our family. Um, <laughs> that's our daughter Casey, our son Zach. Um, that's a rhino. Um, Some people want to get off the grid. Some people want to get on the grid. Some people want to rejuvenate. Other people want to keep learning. And other people want to give back. And uh, people talk about it, wanting to have peak experiences. And yet what most people say is they want to have all of that. That's the new portfolio for one's life. How does one organize that? This is interesting. There have been a few studies, Laura Carsonson at Stanford, a few other people, that have been doing studies on happiness and age. So we decided to go beyond that. We thought, who has the most fun? This is really strange, because we think that young people are having fun. They're not having fun. They may be posting pictures that three minute moment when they look like they were having fun, Who's having the most fun? People in their 50s and 60s. Because they feel more free from obligations and more free to do what the heck they feel like. What else do we ask? Contentment, you know, that which we're all seeking in life, a little bit of comfort with who you are, peaks in the 60s. 
happiness. Oh, young people are happy. That's when everybody's happy. I want to be young again so I can be happy. Guess what? Yes, when we hit our 70s, late 70s, and we start having loss and health challenges and crises and cognitive challenges, turns down somewhat. But the late 50s, 60s, and 70s are the best period of people's lives. And nobody has ever been willing to stand up and say, check that out. Oh, Don's thinking about it. Uh, yeah, when I saw this, I said to Maddie, I said, what, what are we working so hard for? You know, I mean, there's all this good time waiting around the corner. But we are such a workaholic culture, and we measure people by how hard we work and how many hours we pound away, and middle of the night we're doing work texts. And the idea of learning how to be more open and present and happy with one's life, and that's another variable that as you see the suffering of people, and as you circle the sun, I don't refer to birthdays as birthdays, I refer to them as circles around the sun. You know, I want to say, oh, look how old I am. It's like, man, I have circled the sun 68 times, and that's, that's been a great ride. So as you do that more and more, instead of becoming sort of doddering and wishing you could be 30 again, a lot of people are starting to say, wow, I can see the way things work here. I mean, I, I got some perspective, you know, and we don't value that so much in our movies, and our entertainment, and our language. You know, so what is your name, David? So I don't know you, David, but if I hadn't seen you for a while and I said to you, hey, David, it's great to see you. You're looking really young today. He'd probably think, wow, thanks, Ken. But if I said, David, it's good to see you. Boy, do you look old. <laughs> that would be a terrible thing, because we think being old. When we were in Nairobi, last year, the, in, in Maasai tribes, the older people are referred to as elders, and younger people are referred to as junior elders, because they can't wait to get old so that they can have that perspective. Very different than the American style. Um, what are people willing to do? Leisure, do more discounts, cut back, cut back on travel. And people are saying, hey, you know what? I could stay with friends. The fastest growing segment of Airbnb users in America are what, are what they're calling modern elders. All of a sudden you got all these six, you know, Airbnb was originally for kids, sleep on a couch, you know, a few bucks a night. Now you got all these 60 and 70 year olds saying, hey, I'm gonna go to Louisville and stay for a month. Airbnb, I'm gonna go to Paris, or I'm gonna go visit my, my grandparents' hometown. They're finding all these novel different ways to afford their leisure. Home. So housing is an interesting thing and is often not discussed in the same context as financing retirement, yet it ought to be. So you see I'm leaning hard today on the holistic thing because once you get your head on how all these things connect up and they're all fungible in a way and they all can cause the numbers to go up and down, it's a, I think it's a more real way that people can look at their lives. Um, so when you're young, you think, okay, what can I afford? So maybe you can afford this apartment, and then you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever you have, and you share it for a while, and it's a good fit. And then you decide, you know, let's step up something a little nicer. And so maybe you can afford that. And then before you know it, you have a child. And then you decide you're going to, you know, step up into a nicer, bigger home and be a homeowner. And that's where you raise your kids. And then they move out. And then it's a reasonably good question to ask, where should we live? Mostly people ask it from the point of view of convenience and comfort and connectivity. But another question to ask is, what would be the wisest financial decision regarding where we live? A couple of things to know. Uh, the folks at the Millikan Institute, to whom I've been an advisor, some of you probably have been advisors to the Millikan folks. Hold on. Can you advance this next? Oh, there we go. Oh. 
They've done studies on what people are looking for at this stage in life, especially if you're in your 60s and you might have 20 or 25 more years, knowing that towards the end you might need assisted living or you might need better access to transportation and so on. But in those 60s and maybe early 70s, people are saying, I want to be safe and secure. I'd like to have a sense of community. And the highest percentage of all ages of people say, and I don't want to live just with people my age. More younger people say, I just want to live by people my age than older people who we think want to all be in retirement communities. They don't. Only 7% live that way. They want a place where they can learn and grow. You know, I was hearing, by the way, that mayor was very charming, uh, very clever. It may be that there's towns like Oklahoma City as they rebuild, they're thinking, oh, so we can get the young people back. That's an ageist point of view. He didn't say that. But if somebody were to say that, it's like, well, why just the young people? Why not the middle essence? What else? People want an economy that's not dying, but it's affordable. And this one is really sticking here. They want to be able to work or volunteer. It used to be that once you retired, you could be off in the middle of nowhere because working was something that was not going to be a part of your life. Now people are thinking, where can I live so that if I want to work part time? I'll give you an example. Years ago, one of my uh, clients was um, Boswell Hospital in Sun City, Arizona. I was only in my 30s then. And I was really taken by the fact that if you were to pull up to the parking lot at Boswell, there'd be somebody there to meet you in a, in a golf cart to take you to the front door. Nice. Get to the front door and there's a line of greeters to welcome you. Nice. If you're nervous, somebody will give you a neck rub. Nice. The radio station run by retired radio personalities. Nice. Fitness programs run by retired gym teachers. Nice. And then I realized that Boswell Hospital had 2,000 active volunteers. So I'm speaking a number of years ago at the International Mass Retailers Association. And I got the heads of all the major mass retailers, the big ones. And I said, man, you guys ought to go to Boswell and experience what it's like to have a greeter welcome you. That's where the Walmart idea came from. People want excellent health care. And they want it that's coordinated and accessible. Right now, only 2% of the housing in America is aging friendly. 98% is not. You want to know ageism? That's ageism. The people are slipping and falling in their homes, that they're falling in their bathrooms, they're breaking their necks on slippery floors, that, that their electric company comes and checks out electricity but doesn't say, but that wire there could kill your mom. So ageism is not just, maybe I don't respect an older worker, it's baked in. Ageism is also in the aging field itself that doesn't decide to arm itself and go after the housing industry and make all community housing aging friendly or universally friendly. You should also know, and this may surprise some of you, 81% of our over 65 population our homeowners, 72% of which are mortgage free. Now you may say, I'm not, I'm not talking about you. These numbers are real. So you have an enormous chunk of the population who don't know all these young people are whining about because you're not having to spend $3,000 a month for rent. What else? They may be cash poor and brick rich. So they may actually be living poor, but they're sitting on a home that's worth $400,000 or a million six. And we haven't, like they've done in Great Britain, created equity release or reverse mortgages that are trustworthy. So people don't know what to do to finance their future, but many of them are living in properties that are paid off. Airbnb is also targeting them. And two-thirds of them think they're going to move. So last year, I keynoted the renters convention. It's all the people who build rental units. And I wouldn't surprise you to tell you that the overall focus of the conference was 
building rental units for millennials. You know, and I said, excuse me, but first of all, millennials are broke. Um, second of all, you got like tens of millions of people now who are thinking about, you know, selling their homes and maybe living in different places over the next number of years. Who would like to be renters? We ask people why they'd move, be closer to family, to reduce costs. You may think, reduce costs. You mean go from a certain cost of the property or rental or home someplace nearby? Maybe. But what if you're in a state where the whole cost of living is high? You could take your whole lifestyle, move it to a different state with maybe no state taxes, and maybe the cost of living is 60 cents on a dollar, and you can live large for the rest of your life. That requires a willingness to be mobile and flexible, which may be a part of the new financial equation. If you don't have the money saved, you may have to figure out how to tap your resources to go the distance. So I've got just a few more points to make. We ask people what home-related uh, corrections they would consider, downsizing, less expensive vacation, sell my home and rent, take equity out, or refinance my home. Giving. I'm almost through all of these. Um, giving is interesting because we think of finances and we think of contribution. It's usually in terms of dollars. I'm going to show you a clip of a project. It may not be for you. It's not the most amazing thing. But to me, it's a good example of social program creativity. And I will tell you, having been straddling the not-for-profit and for-profit sectors now for four decades, I am taken by how the not-for-profit sector is driven by really heartfelt good people largely without any creativity. And the for-profit sector, you got people crazy trying to figure out new things who may not care about anybody. So if we had more public-private partnering, Man, would we solve some problems. Here's an example of something that is so simple, yet there's very little of it.
Yeah, right? Um, there are thousands of great things that could be going on between the generations that would both make people feel better, connect people, and maybe create bridges of understanding. Uh, I'll give you, I don't know why I'm thinking this because it's a, it's a weird example, but a couple of years ago we had a woman working in our company who uh, was half black and half Mexican and she was quite wonderful. And at one point we decided that we were going to try to understand each other better in terms of our culture. So she said to me, okay, so who's your favorite musicians? I said, there's no question about it. It's David Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks from The Temptations. And she says, I don't even know who they are. I said, who is it for you? She said, Kanye. I said, he's a jerk. And, <laughs> and she says, all right, the game begins. And we spent that next year sharing with each other why we thought different things from our era were valuable and wonderful. And uh, that was a big benefit for me because I realized, wow, I, didn't real I don't know how she looks at the world and now I have a better sense. And she you know, was getting tired of all these old people talking about, oh, back in the day. And it's like she wanted to understand what it was for me. We don't do much of this in our country. It used to be the business of families. Families are getting separated. A lot of people don't have kids or kids that live nearby. I've envisioned that often we think, Don, let's go after companies and get them to sponsor things uh, by paying. I says, why don't we get companies to donate their retirees? I mean, you've got companies with military, for example, with millions of retirees, companies with tens of thousands. If we could arm up grown-ups to teach young people about money and life, you'd have a whole different fabric of America. Two-thirds of retirees say, hey, you know what? This is the best time in life to give back. You know, we think that we should get young people volunteering. Good idea. But they say, wow, this is kind of what it's, this time of life is made for. And then we ask people, interesting, how do you define success? Retirees said, you know what? I used to think it was about your house, your car, your money, your title. Now I'm a little older, I realize it's about your generosity. And I'll, I'll mention another individual here, David Brooks, who's a conservative writer, but I, I don't know, conservative and everything's gotten lost, I guess, now in terms of who's anybody. But he wrote a piece last year about your two resumes, your career resume and your eulogy resume. And he said, when we're young, we focus on our career resume. This is what I've done. This is who I know. This is what I've made. And then you get a little older, you grow up, and you start to realize your eulogy resume matters more. Who are you as a person? How will you be remembered? And you ought to get to work on being that person. I think this is an untapped resource unlike anything the world has ever seen. It's personal also within families. We asked people within families. There's lots of talk about inheritance. We shifted the discussion a decade ago to legacy. And then we asked people, what matters most? People said, yeah, money and property matters. Not the most important thing, even though that's what the financial industry hunkers down on. Personal possessions of emotional value. There was a study in Minneapolis. It was called, Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate? You know, your dad may have had a baseball glove, or there might be a sweater your uncle wore, or the house by the lake. And the monetary value is modest, but the emotional value is high. Next, instructions and wishes to be fulfilled. Uh, before my dad passed away, uh, he did ask my brother and I to spend time with him. He wanted to talk about our mom, who had Alzheimer's. And my dad needed to communicate with my brother and I his wishes, not his wishes, his insistences for how we would look after our mom. Oh, Dad, we don't want to talk about that. We're going to talk about it. And to his credit, he walked us through everything that he had and owned, what things were going to cost, how much he loved our mom, and asked us to promise him the roles we would play when he was gone, which we did. And we fulfilled on 
year and a half ago, our mom died. And my brother and I were both holding her. She died in our arms, in her home. Had my father not had the courage to talk us through that, we wouldn't have known what his instructions and wishes were. We might have guessed at them. But most important, what people want from their elders and what elders want to share is my point of view, my values, my life lessons. In the 14th century, many religions had two wills. A material will, this is what I own, this is who gets what, and what was called an ethical will. Not a great name, but an ethical will, in which people wrote down all the things that they believed and how they wanted them distributed for generations to come, their ideas and beliefs. Before I wind up, and I'm almost at the end, and then we're going to have some questions, I will tell you that when I was in my 20s, exactly 41 years ago, I, uh, my grandfather had passed away, and I decided I was going to get a video camera. Back then, they were big, clunky, reel-to-reel -reel things, and spend a week videotaping my grandmother. And um, my grandmother had been raised in an orphanage. Uh, she was barely literate. Uh, she was sort of a peasant-style, Russian-American type a woman, she was wonderful, and here's a couple of minutes of my grandmother. Touch more volume, just a touch. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me add a little bit of uh, icing to this. Uh, we created scenarios, and I'm only going to show you a couple of quick ones, uh, just a minute on each, of what people might do and the financial impact, which is the kind of fluency that we all ought to be competent at. So we said, let's just say, for example, your family. Your child reaches 22, and you tell them, that's it. We love you. 
you're on your own. If you do that and nothing else, you'll have an extra $105,000 to work with. Let's take another example. Let's say you have a 60-year-old couple living in Seattle, and they decide that rather than stopping work, they're going to continue working half-time for five years. He's a claims adjuster, and she's a dental hygienist. Give them an additional $300,000. Five years to mid-60s, working half-time. Here's a couple living in New Jersey. They're 62. They both have long-lived parents. They think, you know what? New Jersey, my home state originally, it's kind of expensive here. What if we move to South Carolina? By doing that move, selling their home, having that money to work off of, live off of, and not having to pay mortgage, gives them an additional $690,000. But here's the crazy one. You got a 23-year-old recent college graduate working in Boston. His company offers a 401k plan. He's not even sure what that is. By the way, who named these things? 401k. What is that? Does that move you inside when you hear that? <laughs> um, there's a 3% deferral rate. He or she doesn't, in this case, doesn't quite even understand that. He changes the deferral to 15%. Gives him an additional million three hundred thousand dollars. If he was thoughtful about this, and it was part of the reason that he chose an employer, and the employer offered to match the first 4%, by doing simply that, that would give him an additional $1,700,000. Game plan is not that complicated. If we're going to live these longer lives, we have to have the capacity to, from time to time to explore and envision our lives in our later years. It's a good idea to get some input, some expert guidance and help, whether it be from older people or folks who are good role models or bad role models because you want to learn what not to do, or from financial professionals who you might trust, community organizations. Create a strategy that fits. If I was trying to launch a business and I told you I'm going to do this and that, but I only need $8 to fund it, you'd laugh at me. So making sure that a life plan and a financial plan marry. But this just is important. We were doing focus groups in Texas, and one of the guys in the focus group had been involved in the Apollo mission, and they explained that 90% of the time that rocket was off course, even though it had all been tightly planned. That, that the mission was a continual exercise in course correcting. So it is with our lives. We've got to aim for our dreams, but understand that it's OK to make changes and course correct in our family expenses, relationship with our kids, what we do with our homes, how much we save, how much we spend, whether we work longer 